Justice M. N. V. was the 25th Chief Justice of India and the recipient of the prestigious Padma Vibhushan. It is our absolute pleasure and honor to have Justice M. N. V. as the Chairman of Advisory Board of Prayoga. Justice M. N. V.'s concern for the well-being of the society, magnanimity, bright outlook, and benevolent spirit is hugely inspirational, and he is a true role model to the society. We welcome you, sir. I would now like to invite the signature of today's event, Molecule Man of India, as quoted by the Hindu, the peptide man himself, Professor Padmanabhan Balram. May I request Sri B R Nagraj to kindly accompany sir onto the dais. Professor Balram is a biochemist and the former director of the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. He is the very first Indian to receive the R. Bruce Merrifield Award from American Peptide Society. It makes me so proud as an Indian, and I'm sure all of us are equally proud. <laughs> Sir, congratulations. Your achievement has made this 75th year of independence, Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav, even more celebratory to every Indian. It is absolute pleasure and honor to have you with us today, sir. It is my pleasure to invite another uh, dignitary, Professor P. R. Krishnaswamy. Due to some unavoidable circumstances, uh, Professor P. R. K. is not here in person. He'll be joining us online to celebrate this special occasion with us. Professor PRK is a remarkable scientist and the fountainhead of inspiration for all of us. Professor PRK is the senior most alumni of the Department of Biochemistry at Indian Institute of Science, followed by several academic associations in the United States. Professor PRK has spearheaded the establishment of several diagnostic centers in India, including Jaslok Hospitals, Mumbai. Manipal, Sagar, and Malya Hospitals, Bangalore. He is currently a visiting faculty at the Center for Nanosciences and Engineering at the IASC and Transdisciplinary University. We are honored to have you with us today, sir. Thank you so much. We are delighted to have many extraordinary people in attendance today. Scientists from the Indian Institute of Science, National Center for Biological Sciences, Jawaharlal Nehru Center for Advanced Scientific Research, National Institute of Advanced Studies, along with researchers from various reputed universities and industries across India. Students and teacher community from in and around Bangalore have also joined us. We also have many of our research mentors and well-wishers joining us virtually. We are grateful to be partnering with RV institutions in organizing this event. We have uh, Shri Avias Murthy, Secretary, and Shri D P Nagraj, Joint Secretary, from RV institutions, with us today. I extend a wel warm welcome to you, sir. Today's event is sponsored by G D Waldner, Trespa, and Brown Lab. My warm welcome to Shri Ranjit Singh from G D Waldner, and Shri Mohana Pillai from Trespa and Brown Lab. We are happy that all of you could take time out of your busy schedule to be with us today. I am very pleased to extend a very warm welcome to each and everyone present here and joined us virtually. Asatoma Sadgamaya, Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya, Mrityorma Amritam Gamaya, Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. In order to mark the beginning of today's event, I request all our dignitaries on stage to kindly light the lamp to seek blessings from the almighty
Thank you, sir. Dr. Hitchison's journey is the remarkable story of a self-made man with indomitable will and enterprise to build organizations that deliver enduring value and serve the society at all levels. Through his philanthropic act and professional expertise, Dr. Hitchison has established and is actively mentoring and nurturing Prayoga. Recently, Dr. Hitchison led the team drafting the state's position paper on linkages between secondary education and higher edu education in the implementation of National Education Policy 2020. Through Prayoga, Dr. Hitchison is pursuing his vision of having a strong ecosystem for education and research. I now request Dr. Hitchison to talk about Prayoga, its vision, the research and social in initiatives undertaken. Also, request you to take this opportunity and welcome distinguished members to the Prayoga Advisory Board. Good morning, everybody. It has been a historic day in the journey of Prayoga with an illustrious gathering and a bunch of towering personalities who are nation builders are here today and that makes this occasion very special. Uh, respected uh, Professor Balaram, Dr. M. N. Venkatachalaya, esteemed dignitaries from various institutions, industries, members of Prayoga's Board of Advisors, guests from academic fraternity, students, well-wishers, and all other invitees. It's indeed a very significant event for all of us at Prayoga today. I extend a very warm welcome to everyone on this occasion. Prayoga is an education research institution with a vision to bring about a transformation in society by enhancing the utility and quality of learning through research. We have been very fortunate to have received extensive support from everyone, more so from our Board of Advisors, chaired by the most revered Justice M. N. Venkta Chalaya, sir, and former Chief Justice of India, and a scholar of highest standards, ably complemented by, uh, by a team of extremely eminent people the vision they have made us see for the organization is dreams worthy. I would like to provide a brief introduction of Prayoga. Incorporated in 2015, Prayoga is a not-for-profit education research institution with a, collab with a combination of education research and social initiatives. Prayoga intends to contribute to the nation building by providing contextually relevant findings through research and to support improvement in the quality of education while caring for schools that cater to the disadvantaged sections of the society. We are a family of 42 members working at Prayoga, comprising of researchers in education and pure science, and also professionals with capabilities in teacher empowerment and other functions. Our campus is in Raugold village off Kanakpura Road, roughly about 30 kilometers from this place. I invite everyone here to visit our campus and see the work we are doing and uh, extend your advice, inputs and support for this young and passionate organization. We are currently working in the area of school level science and mathematics education research, um, mathematics education research, teacher education research, and also we are working on an opportunity of uh, exploring how the present children who are gifted uh, can, be, can be supported for extraordinary achievements to be future thought leaders. Our major projects are called Kriya and Anveshana. 
Kriya is about understanding the impact of experiential learning of science at school level. We have created the entire content and pedagogy based on the current school curriculum to help students learn the entire science from class 6 to class 10, the experiential way. We intend working with more than 150 schools that will adopt experiential way of learning science in the next five years. The data of about 30 to 35,000 students from various segments of society will help us understand all aspects of experiential learning and its impact on individuals and society at large. Dr. Nayanathara, former professor IMB Bangalore, guides us in this endeavor of the Kriya project. Anveshana is an educational research project that aims to create a framework for nurturing the next generation scientists of our country that our country needs by providing exposure and opportunities for very bright students to adopt research as a pedagogy for learning in the school level that is the formative years. We want to, we intend to deeply understand the formation of attitudes and capabilities required to help individuals move into, are we, am I audible? Understand the formation of attitudes and capabilities required to help individuals move into the Anveshana research project so that they would become the top-notch scientists of the country in the years to come. These students are picked from classes 9 to 12. We are currently focusing on five teams for research. The first is green chemistry and technologies. The second is food and agriculture. Third is ecology and environment. Then it is wellness. And finally, advanced and functional materials. These are the five areas of research we have started with. Illustrious researchers like Professor Balram and Professor Krishna Swami, Professor Gurra, Professor Nagasuma, Professor Onkar, not only guide our research faculty at Prayoga, but also inspire the next generation of scientists. Prayoga and the Anveshana Project are also fortunate to have the support of eminent researchers from reputed institutions like IASC, IITs, and various universities in India and abroad. We draw our inspiration and guidance from very bright minds, a sharp research focus, and hearts that care for the upliftment of everyone in the society and humanity at large. Two people, Professor P. R. Krishna Swami and Professor Balram, who are the epitome of sharp scientific mind, combined with extraordinary benevolence towards humanity have joined the uh, joined a grace and a big grace to mentor Prayoga. We at Prayoga can't be thankful enough for the kindness and willingness of these two exemplary people to support the fledging organization like Prayoga. It is with immense joy and pride that we welcome both Professor Krishna Swami and Professor Balram to the Prayoga family. They're welcome. Research and industry complement each other in propelling pro progress of the society. Mr. Balakrishna Adiga and Mr. M.P. Kumar bring the wisdom and entrepreneurial facets to our advisory board. Prayoga is on a journey to add value to society through its work in the field of educational research. We humbly seek the support of the entire society from research, academic, and industry domains to encourage and strengthen us. It's our good fortune that Professor Balram has gracefully accepted our request to deliver a distinguished lecture based on his spectacular research journey. Professor Balram, who has recently been awarded the R. Bruce Merrifield Award from the American Peptide Society is one of the luminaries this country has to celebrate. Today, it's our opportunity to share our joy of celebrating the achievements 
and listen to him. Sir, welcome to you for the lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, HSM sir. Prayoga will be greatly enriched by the addition of both the luminaries to the advisory board. With the guidance and advice from the board of members, Prayoga's resolve to work towards nation building will be strengthened. We have gathered here today to celebrate science and remarkable achievements of Professor P. Balram. I request our research director, Dr. K. S. Nagabhushana, to enlighten us more on the context of today's event. Good morning. Just now, Dr. Hsn welcomed the two new members of the advisory board. It looks like Krishna and Balaram have come together. And then, mentored by only one of them is actually is a yoga. But two of them, it's Suyoga. So it is Prayoga Suyoga today to welcome both of them to be members of the advisory board. Thank you. Professor Balaram started his education and completing his bachelor's from Ferguson College in Pune. Ferguson College is known for many great individuals, including Balagangadhar Thilak. Soon after his graduation from Ferguson College, Pune University, he did his uh, master's from IIT K, Kanpur. And after his master's, he went and worked with Professor Askal A. Bhotnarbhai, a person who was extremely good in the NMR techniques. Uh, and he was credited with creating the 200 megahertz uh, NMR uh, in association with a colleague. Professor Balram worked for his PhD, and he completed his PhD in less than two years. Two years is generally the time taken for an individual in India to identify a problem to work on. And it generally takes about five to seven years to complete. But he finishes it in less than two years and works with Nobel laureate Professor Robert Woodward who is today considered as the grandfather of organic chemistry because he could synthesize any molecule that was known at that time through his synthetic powers. Professor Balram spends one year with him and synthesizes some of the antibiotics, which are still revered as one of the highest cited articles of Professor Balram. And some of those highest cited articles have been placed on either side of this uh, dais students who are interested in and probably take a look at them. The negative overhazard effect of as probes of macromolecular structures was the work that he did during the PhD time and synthesis of antibiotics, uh, erythromycin was the work that he completed with uh, Professor Robert Woodward. Soon after, at the age of 24, he joins IASE, and, right, and that was a new lab constructed by Professor G. N. Ramachandran in 1971. So he joins that group as a young researcher. Professor G. N. is known for many great things. He worked with Bragg, an extraordinary personality in the XRD. So Professor Balram had by that time, got the greatest of blessings in terms of an NMR, synthetic powers, coupled with a characterization of the you know, technique called XRD. And Professor Gian was the one who could talk about the conformers of the proteins and peptides by working on the circular, circular dichroism 
the phi and the psi angles, the dihedral angles of the alpha carbon, where the amino and the carboxylic acid groups are linked. And he is the one who is credited for deciphering the structure of collagen, which is extensively used in the medical area. And he could provide the triple helix structure for the collagen. So with all these nice elements already built in at a very young age of 24, Professor Balram builds his career and creates extraordinary, extraordinary kind of uh, works which gets published in many internationally reputed journals. And today, he's one of the most cited biochemists with a H-index of 75. 75 articles of him have been cited 75 times. That's what it means. After a certain stage, increasing by one value is very difficult. Getting to 75, next to impossible. He was the director of IASC from 2005 to 2006 to 2015. And at the same time, he was also an editor of a journal called Current Science. And between the time that he was the director, he has consistently published 8 to 10, 12 articles every year. And therefore, I, when he was the director, he published 100 articles, which I counted, actually. Except for one year, where he published only five articles, he has been consistent. Doing this kind of a thing, being a, a director of an institute like IASE, being an editor of a journal which claims international standards, and able to publish as a researcher consistently, it's a superhuman effort. It's a superhuman effort. And he has been cited 22,441 times. This is at 11 o'clock yesterday. It's very dynamic. It may be different by now. He received large number of awards, some of them as young as you know, 28. The Young Scientist Award, INSA Award. He received Bhatnagar Award at the age of 37, while the cutoff is 45. Most of the, if you go and then look at the SS Bhatnagar Award winners, most of them are in the age range of 42 to 45. And he receives the World Academy of Sciences Award in 1994. Uh, it is just incidental that he received Padma Shri in 2022, 2002 and Padma Bhushan in 2014 because he was born as Padma Nabhan Balaram. Coming to the reason why we are here today, we are here to felicitate Professor Balram, the only Indian to receive Professor R. Bruce Merrifield Award. Professor R. Bruce Merrifield received the Nobel Prize in 1986 for his works on what is called as solid phase peptide synthesis. We all know that synthesizing a peptide is the most difficult task because peptides which comprises of amino acids comes up with two functional groups but if it is an acidic or a basic amino acid it comes with an additional functional group therefore coupling leads to large number of byproducts which are undesired because they may have more bad effects than the good protein that you want to synthesize or a peptide you want to synthesize so getting to the right peptide with the right confirmation and the chemistries of chemoselectivity, regioselectivity, and enantioselectivity is extremely difficult. And he has mastered that art. And that is why the highest cited article of him, which works on a molecule called alpha, amin alpha amino isobutyric acid, and the works that he had done and his group has performed on the disulfide bridges and the molecules containing disulfides, and the confirmation resulting from such molecules have got world recognition, and he is a leader in that area. He received this award in 2021, and 
we are celebrating this and congratulate him for the award and we re are really blessed to have him as a mentor for the industry partners and the laboratory builders and other philanthropic agencies prayoga would soon be working on creating a world class wellness and bio related laboratories at the facility wellness is already a thematic area we wish to work in this area and to be known in the world for the work that happens here i thank everyone for your patient hearing end of bashan of bushan thank you thank you sir thank you sir for taking us uh, through the extraordinary research journey of uh, professor balram uh, we have uh, one of the youngest scientific minds amongst us today alive wire at 93 professor p r krishna swami professor p r k joined the department of biochemistry at iisc to work towards his masters degree with professor shrinivas ayya and op later obtained his doctor of science degree working under professor k v giri he further continued his scientific journey in the united states working at tufts university school of medicine boston cornell university medical college new york and la hoya cancer research foundation in california dr prk has notable accomplishments to his credit including the development and introduction of tests for complications in diabetes that is hba1c tumor markers hemoglobinopathies infectious diseases pediatric nutrition inherited disorders and many more a good proportion of dr krishna swami's research has been translational he has patents on recombinant insulin and protein separation innovations sir we are honored to have you on board and thank you for your interactions with the students and guiding them we look forward to hearing your thoughts on this momentous occasion over to you sir <coughs> thank you for those uh, very kind words i beg your pardon collectively for being absent from this very notable function which is a historical day in the history of bangalore which we call the science city of the country unfortunately the uh, virus which invaded this planet decided to before it disappears it wants to catch a few people and um, give a taste of what these molecules in this virus can do and i have tasted it and it has left me but i think the energy that i have is not sufficient to participate today in the meeting physically but i am there in every sense of the word intellectually and emotionally because this relates to the celebration of a very notable person scientist professor balram whose friendship i value enormously because when i came to bangalore from mumbai almost about two decades ago i had the good fortune to get to know him through the hpa1c which i think uh, interested him somewhat and he came with me to mumbai for a meeting and our friendship and i de i take the courage to tell you this courage comes from a deep conviction that this century is going to be the century of uh, proteins and peptides nucleic acids hogged prominence interest support and the very exciting uh, very exciting uh, uh, results which were spectacular in the last century but for those of us who are engaged in uh, research in a broader sense in biology the work on proteins continued in the last century with equal vigor perhaps even greater vigor i should say because the number of uh, 
the, the number of people involved in the research might have been smaller, funds a little modest, but I think the work really produced extraordinary results. And the prize that uh, Professor Balram has uh, been conferred upon, the Bruce Field, the Merrifield Award, represents a phenomena. This phenomena is the continuance of the legacy of uh, Emil Fisher from the last century, and through his uh, disciples, postdoctoral fellows, students, and junior colleagues, a whole number of them, at least eight or ten of them, drawn from the continent of Europe and Americas, who have really engaged in research of a path-breaking nature, continuously during the last century, which we have, which has brought us in the protein field to the stage that we, that we are in. In fact, it is such a thrill for most of us who go Balram to see that he joins this galaxy of scientists in the world who have contributed enormously certain aspects of understanding of peptides and proteins. This is no mean achievement. In fact, if you go back to the history of Professor Balram's uh, rise in the Institute of Science from a very young, young to be a postdoctoral fellow or even a, a doctoral candidate uh, who had a faculty position to have identified an area of work for himself with the most meager of facilities. A lot of times in a very uh, uh, humorous way, he describes the f facilities that he used to muster for his work by making friendship with students in the next department, in the biochemistry department. He was in biophysics and using some of that in the nights, making friends with students who helped him. And uh, the progress began at that time and culminated in this extraordinary achievement in the field of peptide chemistry and uh, protein chemistry, which has really uh, resulted in this great honor for this gifted man. Professor Balram, as I know him, in fact, uh, more you will hear from Balram, so I will not really talk about the, his work and uh, where it uh, led in terms of uh, rewards. He is a most gifted mind, but also very altruistic disposition is evident in all that he has done and continues to do. His enormous appetite for all-inclusive knowledge on most things in life, science, history, literature, education, and other branches of science, even remotely connected, draw his attention. Not only draws it attention, but his study and an extraordinary knowledge, and it is very truly astonishing. At the same time, his uncanny common sense of realities which drive progress by innovation, adaptation, and elegant solutions has continued. This is a very unusual combination of uh, personal qualities which can help a scientist in an environment working where facilities may be limited, uh, funds somewhat meager, but he has utilized this in a very beautiful way because he's a great manager of time and resources without the fuss that goes with it, with most of us. For over a decade heading the IASC, he, with his challenges in administration and growth, bringing uh, current science, be, be, becoming the editor of current science, India's old and reputed journal, and having run that for almost a decade of, to bring it to a great quality, uncommon by any standards. His editorials over the 10 years that he was editor created a sensational new norm of quality, content, balance, and imaginative directions, hardly possible to match. In fact, current science elicited a great deal of interest in the uh, journals abroad for some kind of a partnership at that time because they saw the quality skyrocketing. In fact, many scientists in this country still miss Professor Balram, your editorials, and they clamor for it. A large leadership misses these, a large readership in this country misses your gems in writing even to this day. With many, many more attributes, Professor Balram is by nature a modest and humble person, very easy to approach to students, scholars, scientists, and almost everyone 
without much formalities. His wisdom is uncanny on human affairs, totally involved with people who interact with him, students, colleagues, and his fans, a real sense spread all across the country abroad. He's a student and follow, he's following in this country among the young scientists so, and scholars is unbelievable. Empathy and compassion are the hallmarks of his emotional strength. Both in his personal and official transactions, he has exhibited these two very rare qualities admirably, in fact, admirably and unfailingly in every act. Acts of kindness to the needy in guidance, direction and rescue acts is, he has done with a very quiet uh, attitude and understanding. He is much concerned about education, since science education in particular. His efforts in this, for example, the efforts he made as the director of the Indian Institute of Science resulted in establishing a Chalakere campus of the IASC where teacher training in science teaching is admirably progressing. With all these attributes, his uh, sense of humor and seeing the funnier side of many things in life is uncanny. In fact, I think uh, this disposition and his parts is a good diffuser in terms of crisis. His uh, harrowing experience in COVID, the way he handled it, he and his family all got COVID during the first phase of the uh, epidemic. And I think we were in touch on the telephone almost uh, every single day, several times for the whole period. But in fact, in fact, I made some notes somewhere about the manner in which he was laughing off things. He was enjoying himself. And I think it would make a very good uh, R.K. Narayan or P.G. Woodhouse type of description. This is the disposition by which he, I think, uh, which helps him in coping with a lot of, uh, pro uh, which, which would really put off a lot of people in facing problems and solving them. In, the, in his, uh, his interest in biomedically significant areas in research has, is amazingly sharp. Amazing thoroughness and deeper understanding is not a common phenomenon among classical chemists. He's a chemist, basically, mind you. But I think the thoroughness and deeper understanding he demonstrates on many unrelated uh, uh, topics, unrelated but really crucially connected topics in medicine, in physiology, in pharmaceutical chemistry, it is an extraordinary combination. He is a classicist with a robust fusion of associated sciences. So much can expect from his uh, activities in the future in this country of application as well of the basic findings that are really going on in his lab as well as abroad. I greatly cherish his friendship and bits of collaboration in common areas of interest in a biomedical orientation. Most cherishable of all, his kindness, concern, and respect for the persons he deals with. He is truly altruistic, intellectual, a leader, a path breaker towards heights with a most uncommon disposition of calmness I have ever come across, either it is personal or official or any other perturbance does not really uh, take him. Wish him the best in his personal and professional life. He has a great deal more to share and give, a rare gift to our uh, land. He is also blessed with a spouse who is a scientist in her own right, Hemlata, who is also his collaborator. I wish to end this very brief description of my emotional, intellectual, and uh, uh, professional interactions with him, which have been a gift for me when I moved to Bangalore, by reading out to you a small verse, a group of uh, teachers in a rural area wrote in Kannada, dedicated to a mentor teacher who was an expert in teacher training. The verse reads, in, it was, running, uh, it was uh, written in Kannada, I translated that to English and adapted it for this occasion. 
lamp luminous and shining. Our greetings, good wishes and tributes. Today we celebrate your coveted and precious award crowned on you. Chasing away the darkness and dust, the lamp brings illumination. By distributing light to others constantly, it expands its own energy, it, ex it expands its own energy ceaselessly. Our dearest mentor, friend and colleague, in shining his light on many lives, you are a great beacon on our paths in education, research and service. The ever-glowing light in your life we see should become the light in every one of us. He is our humble prayer to help us serve friends, admirers, disciples and beneficiaries. Thank you very much for this opportunity for me to participate in this uh, event through the medium. I cherish it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, PRK sir, for sharing your thoughtful words and your journey with uh, Professor P. Balram. It's now time to celebrate. It's now time to felicitate the man of the day, Professor P. Balram. Firstly, sir, I request you to kindly take the chair in front. We'll be putting a chair. I invite Dr. Anamika Sharma to deliver the citation. Thank you, Dr. Kritika. Good morning, everyone. It's indeed a pleasure for me to deliver citation for Professor Balram, the Peptide Man of India, on behalf of Prayoga. Professor P. Balram is an eminent scientist well known in the scientific community worldwide. Born in 1949, he obtained his bachelor's degree in chemistry from Pune University, master's from Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur, and PhD from Carnegie Mellon University. After a short postdoctoral stint with Nobel laureate Robert Burns Woodward from Harvard University in 1973 at a young age of 24, he joined Molecular Biophysics Unit at Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore as a faculty. Associates, associating with Professor G. N. Ramachandran. With a relentless pursuit of quality research, creating new heights in research year after year, he served as a director of IASC between 2005 to 2014. Since 2015, he has been the chair professor at National Center for Biological Sciences, Bangalore. Professor Balram's early research focused on the membrane active peptide elamethicin leading to a long-standing interest in the conformational restrictions on backbone folding promoted by the unusual residue alpha amino isobutyric acid, commonly known as AIB amino acid. He has also contributed immensely towards designing and synthesis of disulfide-containing model peptides that has allowed the development of bioorganic models for redox protein containing active disulfide loops. His outstanding contributions are in the investigation of the structure, conformation, and biological activity of designed and natural peptides, utilization of NMR and mass spectrometry for proteins and peptides, studies on triose phosphate isomerase from Plasmodium falciparum, and computational analysis on protein structures. His seminal work can be evidenced from an H index of 75 with more than 22,000 citations, which has led to the success of multiple drug discovery programs around the world. He served as the editor of Current Science Journal from 1995 for almost two decades. He is part of the editorial board of International Journal of Peptide and Protein Research, Indian Journal of Chemistry, Section B, Indian Journal of Biochemistry and Biophysics, Proceedings of Indian National Science Academy, Section B, and numerous others leading journals. He has contributed to multifarious editorials discussing the state of science. In recognition of his far-ranging contributions and services, he was awarded Padma Shri in 2002 and Padma Bhushan in 2014. Other significant awards and recognitions include INSA Medal for Young Scientists in 1977, Shanti Swaru Bhatnagar Award in 1986, the World Academy of Science, that is TWAS, in 1994, and recently, for what this event is about, 
R. Bruce Merrifield Award of 2021 at American Peptide Symposium, APS 2022, which happened in, the, in, in this year in the month of June. Professor P. Balram, an eminent scientist in the realm of peptide chemistry and a beacon of light for the coming generations of researchers and scientists. In this regard, Prayoga Institute of Education Research recognizes Professor P. Balram's exceptional contributions in biochemistry and honors him on this 13th day of August, 2022, and wishes him continued success. Thank you. I'm absolutely amazed and humbled. I now request Dr. Etchison and Justice MNV to kindly present the citation plaque and felicitate Professor P. Balram. Thank you, HSN sir and Justice MNV for doing the honors. I request you to kindly be seated in the front row. We will leave the stage to Professor Balram. The moment all of us are awaiting is here. I now request Professor Balram to kindly deliver the keynote address, finding a problem and following a trail of research and science. Thank you. I must begin by with a large number of thank yous. I must thank the Prayoga for organizing this event. I'm particularly grateful to Dr. Nagaraj, Dr. Nagabhushna for uh, uh, organizing this event and sort of publicizing an award which is rather old. And uh, I I'm also humbled by the fact that I have to speak in front of uh, Justice Venkatachalaya. And uh, I also realize that many of you who are here uh, are probably not in the mood for a completely technical talk. So I will try to tell you uh, the kind of research that I have done over the course of my career, not all of it, but some of it. and. If you look at the title of the talk that I have given, then I can move, no? Can you hear me? Yeah, you can. Wonderful. A good professor always moves around the front of the class. And if I stand there, I'm likely to fall down. There's a, there's a little step there. Uh, the title that I gave Prayoga was uh, How to Find a Research Problem and to Follow a Trail of Research in Science. And I was going to illustrate this with my own example. But if I were to actually title the talk, I didn't give the real title that I wanted to because I thought it wouldn't be understood by anybody. It would be this, what I've written in the next line, finding AIB, the amino acid that took me to a ski resort in Canada. Uh, that's where I went to get the Merrifield Award. 
And what took me to Canada really is an amino acid which I've pictured with its chemical structure on the left side of the slide. And uh, I've highlighted the two words that many of you might find uh, unusual, the abbreviation AIB and the amino acid, all the other things you could easily understand. But the title that I have actually gave in uh, Canada was Constraining Peptide Confirmations, Finding AIB and Beyond. Now, of course, I've highlighted many more words which may not be understandable to people. So my job today is to try and tell you what I have done in my long career at the Indian Institute of Science. How did I spend my time? And was it all worthwhile? Uh, this doesn't move forward very well. Yeah, there it is. I started in December of 1973 when I entered the Indian Institute of Science and as already been said before, I was young, I was ignorant and I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I was happy that I had got a job, I was appointed as a lecturer and what it meant in the early 1970s was that you had a monthly salary anyway and it was a princely monthly salary of uh, a thousand rupees and uh, that's what you got, but that was more than enough to get by. This was what the department that I joined looked like at that time in 1974. And you can see seated right in the middle is Professor G. N. Ramachandran. I pointed an arrow so that you can recognize him. He was a formidable figure at that time, already probably one of India's most highly recognized scientists. And certainly, in my view, when we are celebrating Azadika Amrut Mahotsav, probably the most important scientist of post-independence India. And uh, you will see right there on the top of the slide, uh, if the pointer works, it doesn't, you will see two people, I will highlight them later. Uh, that would be me as a lecturer then, and my very first student. But I'm going to tell you, before I do that, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Ramachandran. Because my entry into the field of peptides is largely because of Ramachandran. His department was supposed to work on peptides and proteins, and therefore you didn't really have a choice of doing anything else that you wanted to do. And uh, I just gave a talk a few days ago at the Homi Baba National Institute in Mumbai. They were also celebrating Azadi Kamrut Mahotsav, and they asked me to speak on Ramachandran. And this is how I started. G. N. Ramachandran really is responsible for the birth of molecular biophysics and structural biology in India. This is the centenary of his birth, 2022, and it's my reflections on the centenary. Much of what I'm going to talk about will involve chemistry, the subject that I studied. Is chemistry important? It is. Uh, in fact, some years ago, the Bombay High Court uh, in one of these peculiar cases that happened in India, was asked to decide on whether steam was a chemical or not. And uh, Justice Venkatachalaya would be happy to know that the Bombay High Court decided that steam was not a chemical. And, uh, but the judges knew their chemistry. They said, we know that it's a chemical, but we are still in law, it is not a chemical, because if it's not a chemical, then the government of India can levy a higher sales tax on the product. And of course the case took 20 years to decide. And after that, the Royal Society of Chemistry put forward a challenge to anybody that they would give them one million pounds if they brought them a material which was not a chemical. And then if you look around you will see that the Royal Society can retain its one million pounds. Nobody will ever be able to find a material which is not a chemical. And uh, the best definition of chemistry is what I've seen here. Chemistry, Arthur Kornberg, the famous biochemist who discovered DNA polymerase, he fired what I think is the first shot of the biotechnology revolution of the 20th century. He called chemistry the lingua franca of the medical and the biological sciences, and it is. Today the sad fact of medical education and indeed biology education in India is the very little attention that is paid to chemistry. 
Galileo many years was reported to have said that mathematics is the language with which God wrote the universe. I might just paraphrase it to say that chemistry is the language with which nature wrote the book of life. Now when you talk about chemistry, the first thing you hear about are atoms and molecules. And uh, atoms, of course, are connected together to give molecules. Are atoms important? In volume one of the famous Feynman lectures at Caltech, to the Caltech undergraduate physics course, Richard Feynman, one of the most quotable physicists of the 20th century, really asked a question. He starts saying matter is made up of atoms, then he says if in some cataclysm all of scientific knowledge were to be destroyed and only one sentence passed on to the next generation of creatures, what statement would contain the most information in the fewest words? Feynman asks this question and then goes on to answer it. He says, I believe it is the atomic hypothesis or the atomic fact or whatever you wish to call it, that all things are made up of atoms and then he describes little particles moving around and so on. He describes the Van der Waals force. What was the cataclysm that Feynman was thinking about in the 1960s? He was of course thinking of nuclear war. It is something that one might still think about because it might destroy everything. And if everything on earth was destroyed and you had to start all over again, if you had to start the intellectual journey in understanding nature, then of course you would have to go back to the idea of the atom. This doesn't work. This is a favorite of mine because when we're thinking about chemistry, we think about Mendeleev's periodic table. And if you look at Mendeleev's periodic table, you will find that there are lots of elements and all these elements join together to make molecules of various kinds, giving us organic, inorganic molecules and so on. Where did these elements really come from? It turns out that every element that we have on Earth was really the Earth's inheritance when it was born. All the elements are synthesized in the stars and what we have is what we were given when the Earth was born. So today when we talk about green chemistry or sustainable technology or sustainable development, what we have to remember of course is that we will run out of elements at some point or the other if we continue to use them indiscriminately. So chemistry's importance I've illustrated. But the molecules that I'm going to describe are the molecules of biology. And the only difference between chemistry and biology is biology is more complex chemistry. The molecules become larger, there are more of them, they, uh, the ideas of scale are different. For example, one might talk in terms of 10 to the minus 10 of a meter when we are talking about molecules. You might talk when you're thinking about cells, you're already up, down to almost, uh, in the case of organisms and all, 10 to the minus 4 of a meter. And then, of course, when you look at whole organism, you're so much larger because you're a collection of a very large number of cells. So chemistry lies at the heart of uh, all of biology. This doesn't work too well. Can I control it somewhere else? Uh, is it? This, okay. I'm going to talk to you about amino acids, peptides, and proteins. And before I do that, before I describe Ramachandran's work and my own, this is what an amino acid looks like, a collection of atoms on the left. A peptide is simply these amino acids joined together, a little bit larger. And a protein is an even larger polymer in which the amino acids have simply been strung out onto a long chain. They are actually held by covalent bonds. And the bond which holds them together, which is marked in blue, green, blue again, is what is called the peptide bond. And that's where this class of molecules gets its name. All proteins are in fact very large peptides. They are polypeptides. And many of the molecules that I will talk to you about are somewhat smaller. Here is just one peptide which I thought I would illustrate. This is what the chemical formula of a peptide would look like. But you will see the letters which I've written in red. You can abbreviate each chemical unit with a letter and then you can write all these letters down in sequence and that would give you the structure of a given peptide. This of course is angiotensin II. 
uh, something that, uh, at least in every audience that I talk about, uh, the first few rows of the audience will be concerned with blood pressure. The last rows will not be worried about blood pressure because they're all young. And uh, this controls your blood pressure. It causes uh, vasoconstriction. You can see uh, it's a fairly complex molecule. It's produced in a very complicated way. There's another molecule which I've not written the structure, but I've given you only the name, which is oxytocin. This, of course, is given for uterine smooth muscle contraction in pregnant women. But today, oxytocin is also important for a field. Oh, I'm out of range. Oh, great. I should come this way. Okay. Wonderful. You think this is going to work better? Ah, yes, it does. Yes. Uh, Oxytocin is a pituitary hormone produced by your pituitary gland, but today oxytocin is the driving molecule for a field called social neuroscience. Because the amount of oxytocin that you have, you now people are now taking oxytocin. Oxytocin sometimes helps you to cooperate, sometimes it helps you to be angry with your surroundings and so on. So it is in fact a, a very active molecule. But if you look at science as a whole, we begin with atoms in physics, we move through molecules in chemistry. The larger the molecules, we move to biophysics and biochemistry. You put them all together, you now have cells and you talk about cell biology. And slowly you organize cells into tissues, into organs, and then you come to anatomy, physiology and medicine. It turns out that much of what we know about biochemistry today has really been driven by studies in physiology and medicine over the previous two centuries. So we've worked backwards in the history of biochemistry. So what I've really written at the top is important. Modern biology and medicine are informed by 150 years of reductionism. And therefore, the kind of chemical reductionism that I'm going to talk about has in fact been useful. In 2009, when the Indian Institute of Science celebrated its centenary, I happened to be the director. We wanted to issue a postage stamp at that time, and I persuaded the postal department to let us issue two stamps. One of them, of course, well, there was no difficulty with the figure. The iconic main building of the institute simply featured on that stamp and everybody recognizes it. Certainly everybody in, who reads the Bangalore newspapers will recognize it. Even when something happens bad in an institution, they will put the picture of that building. And uh, in the second one, I wanted to put Jay and Tata's picture, but they said you can't have a single individual anymore. And anyway, we put Jay and Tata on a stamp much earlier. I asked them, can we put more than one? They said yes. And here are the, is the stamp which was produced. There are many people on this stamp and you may recognize some of them, you may not recognize some of them. Uh, but I want to show you only the person on the extreme left, that is Jain Ramachandran. Because we had to put a student who had been at the institute and arguably the most distinguished student from the institute was Jain Ramachandran who obtained his uh, PhD working with C.V. Raman in the physics department in the 1940s. But you also see three wiggles on the stamp. That I smuggled in. And uh, those three wiggles are the structure of color which he determined, which makes him famous. The wonderful thing about the postal department, which I should tell you, is if the stamp is to be released by the vice president of India two weeks later, they will show up at the last minute and say, where is the uh, picture that we are going to put on the stamp? So at the very last minute, you can do practically anything that you want and uh, nobody will look at it. So there is Jain Ramachandran and one of his most distinguished students, Gopinath Kartha. Together in the early 1950s, they worked out the structure of collagen. Now collagen is a triple helix. You can see three polymer chains sort of uh, winding around one another. Uh, Ramachandran went as the professor of physics to Madras University at the age of 29. And uh, he had to start a new department and begin to do research. Because up to that time, Madras University had no physics department and no research. Now the question of course was, what problem do you find? And I think Ramachandran's choice of problem was absolutely inspired. Because uh, the Central Leather Research Institute was next door to AC College. 
And collagen is what you have all over your skin, everywhere, leather is collagen. And therefore the structure of collagen was not known at that time or there were controversies about it. Collagen is a very large protein. It's a fibrous protein. It's the most abundant mammalian protein. So you, are, you have a lot of collagen in you and all your connective tissue, everything is made up of collagen. So it is incredibly important. But the most unique part about collagen is, if each amino acid is represented by a letter, collagen is a repetitive polymer with only three letters, which I've indicated here. Today, if I were to abbreviate this, I would say G, P and O, just repeating. So if something repeats again and again, the structure must also be repetitive. But then you will see that the, le the amino acid glycine, which has which is the smallest of the 20 amino acids which are coded by genes. It's the smallest amino acid. It repeats in position 1, in position 4, in position 7. That means you must now have a structure which is a threefold structure. There must be some kind of threefold symmetry in the structure. And since it's very small, that small group must come in the middle of the structure because if there was a larger group there would be no place. Ramachandran used to claim in his lectures that he got the idea of the triple helix when he saw his wife plaiting her hair in the manner of a traditional South Indian lady. And it turns out that the three chain structure or the triple helical structure of collagen, this is what it looks like in atomic detail. If you go to Chennai, you will find that there is a triple helix auditorium as you drive past the IIT, you look to your left, uh, when you go from the airport. It is the only auditorium that I know which has been named after scientific structure uh, and not after some famous politician. But in this structure there was a controversy. Was the structure correct or not? Because there were other people working on the structure and the most important person working on the structure was Francis Crick. Crick, of course, is a man whose name everybody knows because Crick and Watson discovered the double helical structure of DNA. When did they discover the double helical structure of DNA? In 1953. When did Ramachandran publish the collagen structure? 1954. And you will remember that there was no airmail then and uh, everything will come slowly to India uh, by surface mail. Now here is a letter written by his colleague Gopinath Karta, who had by this time finished his PhD, finished his postdoctoral work and gone off to Cambridge. And he says, Dr. Craig was telling me, I do not know what he meant, but the general idea seems to be that the publication of our paper was purposely delayed by months for them to work up our idea after seeing our manuscript. So it turned out that the English groups, the same groups which had worked on the double helical structure of DNA, were also working on the structure of collagen. And so when Ramachandran published his paper, they immediately criticized his paper in the journal Nature. And uh, when they criticized his paper in the journal Nature, and I just show you a chronology here, uh, 1954 was Ramachandran's first paper, then go up, 55, 56, Crick was 55. Now you can imagine that a young professor, not yet 35, uh, now publishes something in India and then get crit criticized by people in Cambridge. The criticism of course affected Ramachandran rather deeply and to some great extent determined the rest of his career. But Ramachandran was a very resilient man. What he did was he answered the criticism and in answering the criticism of his collagen structure he came upon his greatest work or his most impactful work on biochemistry. Crick criticized his work saying that if you built a structure, in your structure two atoms come closer than the sum of their van der Waals radii. What does this mean? If you consider atoms as tennis balls, they can be pushed together a little bit but not more than a certain amount. So two atoms cannot occupy the same place at the same time. So if you have a structure in which two atoms do that, that structure must be wrong. Now the question was how close do two atoms come to close, how close do they come? 
Nobody knew at that time, and the field of X-ray diffraction was just beginning to reveal organic crystals. So Ramachandran and his group went back and constructed a table of how close atoms come to one another in crystal structures. And using those limits, which are today called the Van der Waals limits, he obtained what is his most famous contribution. He determined the regions of space in which a residue can adopt an allowed conformation, giving rise to what is called the Ramachandran map, which I picture on the left. While this is technical, I will try to explain this to you. But before I do that, I must tell you what people say about the Ramachandran map in 2011. Nine years after Ramachandran died, well into the 21st century, for work that was done in the early 1960s in India. And here he says, no general biochemistry textbook is complete without a phi psi map of the alanine dipeptide. This iconic plot is a compact representation of a profound organizing idea, one that ranks among the fundamentals of structural biochemistry. And remember, structural biochemistry lies at the heart of our understanding of many, many biomedical phenomena in molecular terms. Why are these proteins which people study important? There's no better way of illustrating the importance of proteins uh, than to show you the coronavirus. Uh, because now everybody from uh, even auto rickshaw drivers know all about the coronavirus. Uh, everybody knows the wonderful symmetrical sphere with the spiky protein projections. That's the spike protein that you see there. A virus itself has been defined as a piece of bad news wrapped up in protein. The importance of proteins becomes clear here. The DNA or the RNA, which is the genetic material, merely tells you it's a book of instructions which tell you how to replicate the biological organism. On the other hand, it is the protein which does all the action. In fact, Arthur Kornberg in his autobiography says, he's the man who did a lot of work on enzymes related to the nucleic acids. But he says that in my theater, the nucleic acids write the script, but the enzymes do the acting. So it's actually the proteins which do much of the action of biochemistry. And that's what the coronavirus protein looks like. And now you can see it's a polymer, which is a long piece of string. And then this polymer wound up in three-dimensional space to give you all kinds of structures. But if you look carefully, you will see some regions of the protein coiling up other regions of the protein being loose, and something else represented by arrows. These are the so-called secondary structures of proteins. And if you look at them in detail, as I would do in a teaching class, this is what they look like. In a helix, the chain sort of winds around an axis. If you stretch it out, turn it around, bring it back and all, you get these extended structures. One on the left is called the alpha helix, the one on the right is called the beta sheet. This is the structure in silk. That is the structure in the protein of your hair. They give it the properties. The Ramachandran map itself really asks the question, each amino acid residue in a protein is what you see at that point where you have a tetrahedral carbon atom, and I have the Greek letters phi and psi around it. At Molecules acquire various kinds of three-dimensional structures because of the degrees of freedom that they have about those single bonds. So you can, and I will illustrate this, I'm very often asked, why do you carry so many pens in your pocket? And one of the reasons, of course, is I like to write in different colors. But the other, of course, is to illustrate the principle of the dihedral angle which Ramachandran introduced to biochemistry. If I have just two atoms which are connected together, as in a hydrogen molecule, there is only one parameter which determines uh, the, uh, the molecule. That is the distance between the two atoms. If I now have two, three atoms, as in the molecule of water, which will have oxygen, hydrogen, and hydrogen, I will get two lengths and one angle. But now if I add one more, as I do here, then of course I have a fourth atom. I can now turn around this. Now I can see what was a two-dimensional structure has now become three-dimensional. So when we think about molecules, we have to think in three dimensions. But if we have to think in three dimensions, we need a parameter. And that parameter is the so-called dihedral angle. Now the dihedral angle is zero. 
the dihedral angle is 90. I go this way, the dihedral angle is 180. Now the dihedral angle is minus 90. This illustrates another very important principle of biochemistry, the question of handedness. One of the structures will be left-handed, the other structure will be a right-handed structure. Ramachandran introduced the idea of dihedral angles in determining the structures of proteins. And he in realized that for every monomer unit in the molecule, you have a pair of dihedral angles. So you can represent a three-dimensional problem in two-dimensional space. He had reduced the dimensional complexity of the protein folding problem. And the Ramachandran map now allows you to calculate what are islands of allowed structures. All of space is not allowed, only some regions of space are allowed, because in the other regions the atoms will come too close to one another. These were calculations done by hand in the days before calculators and computers. And the Ramachandran map still remains, I think, as the most enormous piece of computation done by one of my co former colleagues for his PhD, Professor C. Ramakrishnan, who sadly is no longer with us. I've now illustrated two of Ramachandran's most important pieces of work, collagen and what became the Ramachandran stereochemical map. Now, I must tell you what I have done doesn't match anything that Ramachandran has done. And this I must say right at the beginning itself. Look at, I'll introduce you to something else in biochemistry, our cells. Now, a living cell is actually the hydrogen atom of biology. Because if you now want to make tissue, you have to put cells together. And then if you want to make organs, you have to have more complex structures. Eventually, if you want to make uh, human beings and animals and insects and so on, the complexity simply grows. But a basic cell is surrounded by a membrane. And the most unique feature of this membrane is the contents of the cell remain inside and only some things can get across the membrane. The membrane itself is composed of molecules which are called phospholipids. And phospholipids have the head of the molecule is polar and the tail of the molecule is nonpolar. The tail looks like oil, the top looks like say uh, an ionic substance, say you can take sodium chloride. So the head is soluble in water, the tail is not soluble in water. And since oil and water don't mix, if you have phospholipids, they will spread out into bilayers, and the bilayer membrane will now encompass the cell. This is a grand idea. Just think about the evolution of life on Earth. Before life evolved on Earth, it must be preceded by chemical evolution. So if you might ask, what would the first cell look like? The first cell must have a well-developed membrane to separate the internal co contents from the exterior surroundings. On this membrane, there will be protein stuck. The coronavirus is a good example. The coronavirus is an enveloped virus which has a bilayer membrane. And that spike protein is stuck into that bilayer membrane. It's a true marvel of biological evolution. So when I joined the Molecular Biophysics Unit in the end of 1973, I walked in. I must say that I still remember the date on which I went in. It was the 1st of December 1973. And I was going to go and report to G. N. Ramachandran as a lecturer. So I, I had put on uh, a coat and a tie, and that was, I think, the last time I put on a coat and a tie until I became the director. And. Uh, I went in, I saw him, and then he asked me, do you know anything about the structure of collagen? And I said, I don't. And he said, thank you, and our meeting was over. And uh, I came out, and then I met a bunch of students. And the very first student that I saw was the student who's pictured along with me on the top right of the slide. Uh, he's again pictured with me again 34 years later because we stayed in touch and we collaborated uh, on and off. He was slightly older than me and uh, therefore he was probably a little bit more mature. So when he saw me, he said he didn't have a PhD supervisor. 
And since he didn't have a PhD supervisor, he said, uh, look, uh, you're my supervisor now. Because I had the grand title of lecturer, and so I was authorized to be a supervisor. Uh, so I became his supervisor, and I said, what are we going to do? And he said, look, I'm already working on the structure of membranes. And uh, there are other structure of membranes. In 1972 in science, this paper had just appeared. It was a paper which revolutionized our understanding of biological membranes called the fluid mosaic model, which uh, looked at the lipid bilayer as a two-dimensional fluid in which proteins were embedded and moved. It's largely correct. But membranes are important because all the action happens at membranes. At the neuromuscular junction, for instance, uh, two cells actually communicate with one another really by having chemicals sort of secreted by one cell which act on the other. And then they set off chemistry and electricity work together in the body. And it turns out that you have electrical signals that are then propagated along nerve. So, there were these papers which had appeared, very famous papers, which fe fetched the Nobel Prize by Hodgkin and Huxley in the Journal of Physiology in 1952. And these papers, if you look at them, they are full of uh, differential equations and uh, nothing else. Uh, but they had a model for nerve excitability of what was called nerve conduction. Conduction of electrical impulses by nerves. And so Krishnan, who had a master's degree in electronics and who'd worked in some division at the Baba Atomic Research Center uh, decided that he was now going to solve the problem of nerve conduction. He then imagined that he and I would team up together and would become a latter-day Hodgkin and Huxley. And so the two of us, knowing nothing, uh, began to tell everyone that we are working now on biological membranes. We didn't know anything about it, we read about it, but then we soon found out that everybody else in the surroundings knew even less than us. So in a little while, we were the local experts on Hodgkin, Huxley, and uh, biological membranes and nerve conduction without, I think, knowing anything whatsoever at all. But this went on for some time, and I learned more about membranes. <coughs> One of the problems with membranes is ions cannot go across the membrane easily. Something has to carry it or something must allow it to pass. And there are two ways of doing this. One, you can have a molecule which grasps an ion and ferries it across. The other is you can have a structure which spans the membrane, which is called a channel, which can open and close according to the electrical potential across the membrane, and these are called voltage-gated channels. And so we studied about these and uh, we messed around generally. And the best way actually to find out uh, what you might want to do is to go and read in the library. Uh, the advantage in G. N. Ramachandran's department in the early 1970s was the department did not have a building, the department had no laboratory, the department had no chemicals, and the department had no equipment. So the advantage with complete poverty is that it allows your imagination to run free. And uh, our imagination really ran free because we even thought that we could understand Hodgkin and Huxley at that time. And uh, one day when I was reading this, I came across this molecule here, and uh, there was a famous Soviet group which had published the structure of this molecule, which was that cyclic, really ghastly structure up on the top left of the slide. And uh, those were the days of the Soviet Union, and we ha used to read all those papers with uh, great interest. And this was an English paper which had now corrected that. So a molecule which was a cycle had suddenly become a molecule which was no longer a cycle, but which was long. And so when I saw this, I said, look, if the only way you find out whether a structure is right or wrong is to make the structure, in the, make the chemical in the laboratory and compare it with what is available naturally. That's the classical approach of the synthetic organic chemist. And then I found an abbreviation which I did not understand called MEA there. And then I found MEA was nothing but what today I call AIB. This was the old abbreviation, this is now the new abbreviation, which everybody's accepted. And so I had found an amino acid. And this amino acid, when I looked in the literature, there was very little known about it. 
But why was this molecule important? This molecule was important because if you embedded this molecule in an artificial bilayer, it gave you voltage-dependent conductance across the artificial bilayer. So it was a model then for membrane protein channels which nobody had ever studied at that time in the mid-1970s. Today, of course, we know everything that is there to be known about uh, membrane channels because many revolutions in science have taken place. So that's the amino acid that I want to make, which is there. And the most wonderful thing about this was, I asked myself the question, can we make this amino acid? What are the chemicals that we need to make this amino acid? And luckily, the chemicals that you need to make the amino acid are only acetone, which was available, uh, sodium cyanide, which was available in plenty. In fact, lots of it was available in Yashwantpur from where we used to buy chemicals. This is because the Kohler gold fields used to use a lot of cyanide. And after the gold fields shut down, there was still a lot of cyanide around with no use for it. And uh, so one could get cyanide very cheap. And then you needed ammonia. And there was an ammonia cylinder in the organic chemistry department, which if you opened, you could now liquefy, get liquid ammonia, and then you could pass gaseous ammonia into a flask. So we could make this. So my first student and I began then to make this molecule. There's a great advantage in being a faculty member, because the great advantage in being a faculty member is you can now take a PhD student. Once you take a PhD student, you can go and sit at your desk and the PhD student will do all the hard work. And so the business of, uh, you know, mixing up the cyanide and uh, putting in the ammonia, but I was young then, and I was enthusiastic, so we would together mix the cyanide, and we would together bubble in the ammonia, and eventually we made the amino acid. Then you have to make them into peptides. But at that time, making peptides was also not easy, because there are not many reagents available. This is the reagent which was introduced for protecting amino groups by Max Bergman and uh, Leonidas Zervas. It's a very famous piece of work at Rockefeller University. Much of the early work on protein chemistry was done in the laboratory of Max Bergman. Max Bergman had studied with Emil Fischer in Germany and moved uh, before Hitler began his purges uh, uh, to the Rockefeller. And it's in fact in this very same laboratory that Bruce Merrifield many years later developed solid phase synthesis. And of course, dicyclohexyl carbodiamide, which I showed you, was introduced into the literature by Hargobind Korana when he began to work on nucleotides. Because if you want to remove water by condensing two molecules, you use dicyclohexyl carbodiamide. Did I have any experience for starting to do this? I must say the only experience that I had to start I for starting to do this was when I was an MSc student at IIT Kanpur. Um, uh, the professor with whom I worked for my project, Professor Balasubramaniam, he asked me to make peptides. And so actually I was trying to make a pe peptide uh, which was actually originally made by Emil Fischer. And you can see that I have located my uh, old MSc uh, project notebook and this is a page from it. So these are my credentials for embarking uh, on this uh, activity. Uh, the work went reasonably well. Uh, at that time, we thought nobody in the world would ever work on this problem because we didn't know if anybody was interested and uh, I had no idea whatsoever. And the last paper which had appeared in the literature was in 1960. And uh, we were now doing this in 1975, 1976. And uh, it turned out that in that paper, there's the first author, a man called Leplavi, a Polish gentleman who had gone got back to Poland. And this is where history is important. Poland was not very much better than India at that time. So I think it took Professor Leplavi quite a while to set up. I think we were actually slightly better off because we had the Yashwanpur shops available to give us all these uh, sourced so, so chemicals. But many years later, there was an American group which began to do this work. And then I found, only when I was going for the Merrifield lecture, I found the connection. It turned out that there was this Polish group which had been working, and it says all doctors from Leplavi's group leave loads and join excellent laboratories in the USA or England as postdocs. And he says Marshall's plan and features a very prominent uh, American chemist called Garland Marshall. Of course, this is a pun on the Marshall plan which rebuilt Europe after the Second World War. 
but other people did it. But there were two pieces of theoretical work which I was unaware of at that time, and uh, one of them was done by G.N. Ramachandran himself, uh, published in an American peptide symposium. Took two years for the book to come out. The symposium was in 70, the book appeared in 72, and I think it appeared in our library in the department maybe three years later, by which time nobody ever looked at it. In fact, even Ramachandran, I think, had largely forgotten about uh, this work when we began. And so we had a little bit of work, uh, background work available when we started doing this. And at that time, the reigning view was if you made short molecules like these, they won't fold like proteins. Rather, they will not have any structure at all. And of course, we had no intention of making very large molecules because we did not have either the expertise, the resources, or even the inclination to do so. So we were rather stuck with rather small things. So here we are. So we made a molecule, and then we began to investigate what its structure was. And the method was the method which, when I was introduced, this was the only method that I knew when I came to Bangalore that was nuclear magnetic resonance. And therefore, there was an NMR spectrometer, an old NMR spectrometer, in the organic chemistry department. You can see me sitting there in front of the spectrometer, and the spectrometer was a larger, in those days, a rather formidable piece of equipment. It had large numbers of knobs. It looked like the cockpit of an aircraft. And uh, nobody knew which knobs to turn which way. And uh, fortunately, I had learned which knobs to turn which way. And so when I came in as a young man to the organic chemistry and went and asked them, can I use your machine? Uh, they allowed me to use it because they found that this way I could do their work also. So I was converted for a little while into an operator of the machine, and I used to operate the machine. And so I'm very proud of this, because I've located it after they gave me the Merrifield Award to show it to them, and I found all these day pieces of data. What these two pieces of data tell us, that those atoms which I have marked in red, I've circled in red, the molecule has adopted a structure, and those atoms are buried somewhere inside. So we are now saying that these molecules are now folding in solution, even though they are very small. Now, of course, when we found all this, we were terribly excited. We wrote it up, and we sent it off to the Journal of the American Chemical Society, which was the only journal I knew, because when I was a PhD student, my papers were published in the Journal of the American Chemical Society. We promptly got back uh, a referee's report, which said, that if we want to characterize such peptides, we require acceptable elemental analysis or a mass spectrum. Now, there, there was no mass spectrometer in the Institute at that time. Mass spectrometry was not what it is today. The techniques were different. There were horrendous machines. There was none in the neighborhood. So there was no question of getting a mass spectrum. The elemental analysis is a much more formidable piece of uh, analysis, because only people in the 19th century could do good elemental analysis. By the time the 20th century came along, the number of people doing good analysis was very little. And there was one analyst in the organic chemistry department who would do this, but he would generally give you the analysis which you wanted if you told him in advance. So this wasn't exactly the most uh, convincing way of figuring out whether you had the right material. So the question was, how do we determine the molecular mass of the substance that we've made? And it was at this point that, because I was in Ramachandran's department, and there were a lot of crystallographers, by listening to them, I realized when they got single crystals or very small molecules, they would determine the molecular weight by measuring the density of the crystal. How do you measure the density of the crystal? You measure the density of the crystal. I made this to show in America. Uh, you would use a specific gravity bottle, you would get two liquids which were immiscible, and the crystal should not dissolve in the liquid, because if the crystal dissolves in the liquid, you've lost your crystal also. But then you will adjust the mixture such that the crystal floated right in the middle. If it sank, it's too heavy. If it floated, it's too light. And then if you had a mixture in which it just floated, you then measure the density of that crystal. You measure the density of that liquid, and that's the density of the crystal. And so we mesh began to do this. But then when we got very good crystals, there was an X-ray generator and a Weisenberg camera. 
So, and there was a postdoc, Dr. Shamla, who also, like me, was largely jobless. And uh, so we asked her, and she said, yes, we will mount it and take a picture. So we took a picture, a wonderful X-ray diffraction photograph. So then she said, that I'll try and solve the structure. And so here we were. We knew nothing about crystallography. We had got a crystal. We had someone telling us that they would solve a structure. And in those days, it was not very easy to solve the structure because the computers were slow. But she nevertheless, she solved the structure. And we got exactly the structure that we thought we had. And so we went, we published first in one journal. They went back to the Journal of the American Chemical Society with a larger paper. And this, by then, we were on our way. And this introduced me to crystallography. There was only one other molecule with an AIB residue in it at that time. And uh, that was done in 1976. And our structure was also done in 1976. The only difference was ours was linear. That was a naturally occurring molecule. So now if you look at Ramachandran maps, you understand why the AIB residue makes structures because it looks like both, uh, uh, it looks like alanine with an extra methyl group, so you get this kind of what one calls conformational restriction. But that's a technical point which I think in a lecture like this might be inappropriate. But once we got crystals of one kind, then of course we could make lots of molecules and we began to get lots of crystals. And we then realized that what we were forming was, was a new kind of helix, which was called a 310 helix. At that time, there was only one helical structure for polypeptide, which had been well characterized, that is the Pauling alpha helix. And the 310 helix is a small structure in proteins, but in peptides, you can make it grow longer and longer. So this was now a new helical structure. Other people in the world also began to work on this in the 1980s, and eventually you can see that you can build these long tubular structures, and this was quite interesting at that time. As our structures became longer and longer, our facilities became less uh, usable for the project because we could not solve larger structures because of the X-ray facilities which we had at that time. We could also not uh, do it because of the kind of computational facilities which are available. And by this time, Dr. Shamala had also uh, gone away to the United States uh, if, f to do other things. I then wrote a letter to one of the prominent crystallographers in the world, Isabella Carl, and asked her would she be interested in doing these structures because we were getting these molecules. She wrote back very cautiously, saying that, yes, you send me the crystals, and I will see if they diffract. And uh, so I sent her crystals, and she immediately wrote back to me saying that they're diffracting marvelously, and so the first of these big structures is the one which I illustrate, which was published in 1986. Uh, this was delayed slightly, uh, because I think in 1985, her husband, Jerome Carr, was given the Nobel Prize for the methods for develop which were used in these structure determinations, the direct methods of phase determination. Uh, she was, in fact, omitted from the uh, award of the Nobel Prize, although she was the first person who actually showed that the direct methods, which are mathematical methods, actually work in practice. By the time we began our collaboration, now I realize in retrospect she was 65, the age at which I formally retired. And uh, when we ended our collaboration with the last structure in 2011, she was exactly 90. And she passed away uh, three years later. So we made many molecules. We characterized them. I will not uh, tell you this. In fact, I would like to go faster if this uh, projector allows us. 
But when you do such structures, you learn other things. You learn about how molecules fold. You also learn about how they unfold by solvent, for example, invading them. This is interesting for people who study the mechanisms of protein unfolding. And so for a while, we worked on these things. We made large molecules. Today, these are very useful because for materials applications where you want spaces and so forth, you can use these rigid structures, and many people are doing them. There are other things that you can do with peptides. You can go back to proteins and ask the question. If you have a helix, in a protein it stops at some point. So if you have a long string of letters, that string of letters codes the information for folding. But there are also punctuation marks which tell you where a structure should stop and another structure should actually begin. Those are what I call stereochemical punctuation marks. If you know what they are, you're actually determining the grammar of the folding code. The genetic code is the one which translates the information in DNA into the sequence of proteins. But the folding code is the one which translates the sequence information into the three-dimensional structures. Today, of course, with a lot of three-dimensional structures, we now have a program which is based on artificial intelligence and machine learning called AlphaFold, which will predict the structure uh, from the sequence. But that, of course, depends on the number of structures that you have determined over the years which form its learning set. So if you want to terminate helices, you must put residues in a particular place in the Ramachandran map. And for that, the AIB residue is very good, and we were able to generate many of what are called Shellman motifs in doing this. So I will pass quickly through this. So eventually, this is what we wanted to do. We learned how to make small pieces of proteins, and we wanted to put them together. But we had learned only how to make helices. But we hadn't learned how to make things which sort of hairpin-like structures. We didn't know how to make them at that time. And I'll show you on the next slide something that is rather interesting. We made the molecule on top and wrote a paper in Nature saying it's a model for folding. At the same time, we got the molecule at the bottom on which we determined a structure. And when we determined the structure, we found the first proline residue had a configuration was which was different. It was D-proline instead of L-proline. It was the mirror image. But in those days, D-proline was not available. And so the question was, where did we get the D-proline from? We never bought it, but it was nevertheless there in our structure. So it could have come from the synthesis. So we spent a lot of time trying to figure out whether during a synthetic process, L-proline had isomerized to D-proline, but it didn't happen that way, and proline was not an amino acid which racemizes easily. Eventually, I think, again, I never did understand this, but in preparation for the Merrifield lecture, I thought I had the answer. And the answer, of course, again lay in Yashwanpur, because in Yashwanpur is where uh, we used to buy the amino acids at that time, and they would sell us L-proline, and they would also sell us DL proline. I mean, he had DL proline, but we wouldn't buy it. But he would sell us five grams in a small bottle. We would come back and weigh it and find it was three and a half grams. And, you know, that's all, uh, that's all you could do. Uh, then I realized that he must be adulterating L proline with DL proline, and this thing had selectively crystallized out. But what it did was that structure taught us how to make the hairpin. And uh, in fact, ironically, that paper is quoted quite a lot in the literature. And this is why you shouldn't take citation seriously at all. <laughs> That's what happens. Proline is restricted in that part of the Ramachandran map. If you take the mirror image, just invert through the center, that it will be restricted the other way. So if you know where to put the residues in the Ramachandran map, you can now make, uh, make a structure. And uh, we were on our way then to making these, so we made these. And here, of course, I have a digression. We made it, and we made it successfully. It took us a, a while experimenting, but after we'd got the structure, as usual, I sent it off to the Journal of the American Chemical Society. The referees of the Journal of the American Chemical Society have done me more good uh, than anyone else. Uh, they promptly rejected the manuscript. And uh, once they rejected the manuscript, we published it elsewhere, 
But then I wondered, oh, the only way to do this is to get a crystal. And then, to our surprise, these molecules also began to crystallize because they were well folded. Now they did not have AIB in them, but they were crystallizing. And so we got a structure. And that's the structure that I show you on the left. But I want to show you really... Uh, oh, it's going backwards. Ah, yes. I want to show you also how science works. And... Uh, I mailed these crystals to Dr. Carl. It was a difficult structure to determine, but in 1995, and you can see everything is handwritten, everything used to come by mail. By 1995, we had fax, and uh, everything was coming by fax now. And there it is. She got so excited when she saw the structure, and by 1995, she was 74 years old. Uh, slightly, almost my age now, I'm slightly older than what I am today. And there she was, she'd written all the dihedralang, all the Ramachandran angles out uh, by hand, which shows the excitement that she had and faxed it to me immediately. And this is of course, I just put this up for students in case they're there. Uh, 2011, one of the last letters that I got from her, and you can see that the handwriting is wonderful. Today you will find very few people having uh, such handwriting. In fact, this is the slide which I showed in the Merrifield Award lecture, which attracted the most attention. And for most, the most attention that it attracted was for her handwriting. And there it is, you can see Carl at her retirement at the age of... Uh, by that time, I think, 90, uh, 89, thereabouts. Uh, once we do this, you know how to do it. Then, of course, you have lots of PhD students. You do more of it. You do more of it. And eventually, you know how to do this. The only other thing which you have in engineering peptide structures is to find some way of connecting up the pieces together, and that nature does in the form of a disulfide bond. So this was something that I was doing right from the early 19, late 1970s, and uh, this turned out to be fairly productive. And over the years, these kinds of molecules have been used by others to make catalysts, and uh, that's where I think the applications have come. Eventually, as you try to mimic proteins, we went to larger and larger structures as our facilities became better in the late 1990s. By this time, we also had mass spectrometry and we could characterize our molecules better. Our NMR methods had become better. But of course, by this time, I had also become older. And uh, one of the largest molecules that we made was this. And these are all NMR-derived structures. By this time, it had become easier to publish. Uh, these structures uh, without uh, X-ray diffraction. Uh, and we began to put pieces of these together much the way you make models in a league of set. Gosh, this thing will take my ear off, off if not the mask. No, it fell off. Put it back yeah, so, yeah. That, so that I can still be heard. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. This is one thing which you need someone else to do for you. You just can't do it. I'm going to conclude now very quickly, but to tell, just show you that as one moves on, one asks other questions. Now the question was, can we add other more extra atoms in these by using amino acids which had more number of atoms in the backbone? which are not the alpha amino acids and proteins, but beta amino acids and gamma amino acids. So a student of mine began to do this. We once again began to characterize these structures and crystallize them, and we tried to publish this in the Journal of the American Chemical Society again. This time, the, ed the referee objected. He said, we can't call them peptides, because they're not peptides. So I went back to the literature and found what Emil Fischer had written in 1906 in German, and what he said, he never said they had to be alpha amino acids. They only had to have an amino group and a carboxyl group. So this also is a larger family of peptides, what today are called beta and gamma peptides. And this was the first example of a hybrid helix. This field, uh, however, moved rather quickly because there were other people working in the United States and in Europe. Uh, Data Sebak at the Eteha 
and Sam Gelman in uh, Wisconsin, they were working with other kinds of uh, beta amino acids and they generated these marvelous structures, 1996, which is around the same time that we also published our structures. Many years later in 2004, Sebak summarized this in a huge review of 200 pages. I was very happy when I saw this review. By 2004, I was practically an administrator. And so every now and then would feel happy if I saw a paper in which someone had referred to my work. And every scientist likes this. And here was Sebak referring to my work. And then when I looked more closely, I found that he had even put structures which we had determined and published into his uh, paper. Then he'd written this, and this I thought sounded very nice. He said, and I never read it after that. I said they've done with virtuoso systematic mutations, etc., etc., and that you've done this. I said, look, I've come coming towards the end of my career. I'm going to become the director of the Indian Institute of Science, maybe, and uh, uh, sort of generally have less time for research, and hear someone saying nice things about you. But in preparing for the Merrifield lecture, when I put this in, I found that he said something in Latin on top. And so now I don't know what he said. So I went back and tried to translate this by going to Google and found that this is a famous quotation. And what it says is, it is not always needful that a good archer hit the white. Sometimes he may miss. And uh, I now think what Sebak was saying, while we might have been good archers, this time we didn't hit the target with these amino acids, rather we were off the mark because we didn't recognize their importance. Other people did recognize their importance and worked very much harder on them and uh, I think did far more important things uh, with them. But nevertheless, it turns out that all the work which was done on AIB peptides eventually produced, uh, provided the basis on which these new amino acids were also used. So I've come to the end of my presentation here. There's Ramachandran again. There is his prediction of 1972. After all these crystal structures have been done, uh, m many of these from Bangalore itself, you can see that they follow Ramachandran's predictions absolutely perfectly. I'm going to conclude this lecture by showing you only one thing. And I see my friend Dr. Shikanta here in the audience. So this is really for him. Is this kind of work of any use at all? Today, we are always asked whether uh, the work that you're doing is going to solve some major problem tomorrow. It may not solve a major problem tomorrow, but it might be useful to someone who's solving a major problem uh, somewhere else. And this is the problem of diabetes. And in the case of diabetes, molecules which are being today used at the, uh, therapeutics for type 2 diabetes are what are called glucagon-like peptide uh, agonists. And I'll show you on the next uh, slide the sequence of native glucagon-like protein and a drug which came on the market from Novo Nordisk, uh, a drug called liraglutide. It's again a peptide and it has two changes. It's exactly like the human molecule. It has only two changes at two positions. One of those positions is where a lysine is replaced by a glutamic acid just to give a handle to attach a fatty acid. The reason a fatty acid is attached there is it then binds to the serum protein, serum albumin, and stays longer in circulation. This molecule was doing pretty well, but the problem with this molecule is, is the following. It's a molecule on top, and the molecule which is now in the market from Novo Nordisk there's only been a replacement. What has been put here for binding to albumin is slightly modified. But the key substitution is really where I have marked it, where the AIB residue has, been repla has replaced the alanine. The reason is that we have in our bodies an enzyme called dipeptidyl dipeptidase, which breaks the first two amino acids and then the molecule loses its activity. If you want to stop this breakage at that point, all you have to do is to substitute the alanine. This looks simple, but this took 12 years of work at Novo Nordisk to actually reach this conclusion. So finally, I was very pleased uh, to find that AIB has now been introduced into a molecule in which the first three-quarter sales of 2021 
are 4.6 billion dollars. So that's a lot of money. And uh, in principle, if one follows up work, one has a target like they had and does this purposefully, I think many of these things are indeed possible. But uh, I will conclude by showing you only my last slide, uh, which is just an acknowledgement to the two institutions which have been uh, my home for the entire part, I would say, of my career. The Indian Institute of Science, where I spent uh, officially uh, 41 years, unofficially a couple of years, and the National Center for Biological Sciences, which uh, has provided me a home uh, in my retirement years. Lastly, I would just like to conclude by saying that in science, one doesn't always have an extraordinary problem to solve. Uh, very many times the problem that you get are the problems that you encounter as you are solving a much simpler problem. And then the problem slowly magnifies. So at times beginning researchers might be doing things which appear purposeless. But what you must realize is that purposeless research can sometimes turn purposeful as long as you stick to the job of understanding the results of every experiment that is done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Balram, for an I mean, insightful talk. Sir, I'm honestly lost of the right adjectives to describe how much I enjoyed your talk today. And I'm sure the feeling is mutual among the audience as well. Thank you for, in for, thank you for the enlightenment you have bestowed upon us. The podium is now open for question and answer session. Some of the instructions for the audience are, please raise your hand so that you can be easily identified. Our volunteers will get the mic to you. Please introduce yourself first and then ask the question and kindly keep it precise or concise. Uh, hello. I'm here, Professor Balram. Uh, my question is, uh, that in the course of your work on peptides and also on synthetic peptides, uh, did you get any insights regarding uh, how proteins fold, except that they fold in the physiological conditions and you try to fold in the MSO, I guess? Uh, I didn't hear your question uh, completely. Are you asking me whether from work on peptides do we get in any insights into how proteins fold? Yes, in the larger sense, yes. What I was saying was that when you were working with uh, small peptides and also some of those which were synthetically prepared, were you obtaining some insights regarding how they fold in the larger proteins, except that the solvents were different? In your case, probably you were using some NMR solvents like DMSO. And no, others know, were in physiological uh, conditions. Yeah, I, I must say this, that when you're trying to engineer folded peptides, you're actually learning from proteins. So side by side, you're always analyzing protein structures also to get clues. Uh, the advantage of amino acids, which don't have much conformational freedom, is that you can place them at specific positions in the sequence in order to nucleate folding. So if you, the question is, have we learned anything about folding from peptides? We've learned a great deal about folding from peptides. Have we learned something about how to make peptides by looking at protein structures? Yes, you learn a great deal by looking at protein structures. In fact, we've done that all the time. Uh, uh. So good, um, good morning, sir. I'm Kirtana, MTech student. Uh, so my question is, you were telling about diabetes. So uh, where, where, where are you? I can't. Ah, wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Ah, yeah. Uh, sir, so using these molecular um, things, can we just detect diabetes early? Because in artificial intelligence, we were trying to do this. 
so can we play in, in the molecular aspect and can we detect early diabetes like this person will be prone to diabetes in so and so year something like that so your question is can we detect diabetes at a much earlier stage than is done today is yes. that your question yes sir yes yeah. I won't answer that question because I really don't know. But in fact, Dr. Shikanta, who's here and with whom I collaborate, uh, the problem of trying to identify from patients uh, conditions which might indicate that they are going to become diabetic, something of great interest, actually. You're actually looking for early markers, and uh, I'm sure there are. We only have to find them. And I'm sure other people are also trying to find out. Uh, sir, I'm Jyoti from uh, Vijaya College. I teach in Vijaya College. Uh, I just wanted to know what is 310 helix which you were speaking about? 310 helix. Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. The light's in my eye. That's why I can't see you. Yeah. What's, a, what's a 310 helix? Oh, oh. Yeah. Wonderful, you're giving me an opportunity to tell you a story. Uh, the 10 is only the number of atoms which are there in the hydrogen bonded ring. But three is a more important number. Three is the number of residues per turn of the helix. So a 310 helix is what we call an integral helix. But it turns out that integral helices are rare in proteins. So the fundamental breakthrough in determining the structures of proteins was the 1951 formulation by Linus Pauling of the alpha helix. The alpha helix is a non-integral helix. It's called 3.6 residues per turn, which means you have to go five turns before you come exactly to the same point again, because 3.6 into 5 is 18, and that's the next whole number. Non-integral helices were unanticipated at that time. Everybody worried on, only about integral helices, but they didn't explain the extra diffraction data coming from proteins. In fact, there's a very famous paper in 1950, just before the Pauling paper. It's written by three scientists, uh, Bragg, Kendrew, and Perutz. It's the only paper that I know in which all three authors got the Nobel Prize, one before the paper, two some years later. But every single structure in that paper is wrong. And uh, this is largely because they were stuck on this problem of uh, integral helices. So when the integral helix was found in peptides, that became a novelty. It's not truly hugely important in proteins. It may be important in regions of proteins which span the lipid bilayer membrane. Uh, can I? There is a follow-up question that I yeah. wanted to elaborate on. That uh, what was the uh, insights that uh, led you towards the protein folding? Particularly, I'm interested in why is it that there is some kind of a handedness preference later on as the structures grow in size? Oh, you mean why was Anfinson's work important? No, why was the handedness, 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 the right-handed and the left-handed? Why oh. is it not equally preferred? Yes. Uh, you know, the problem if you ask me questions, and this is one of the problems as you get old, is that for every question I'll have a story. And uh, actually the story on handedness is a truly interesting story because it concerns Ramachandran. I had it on my first slide at the Merrifield Symposium. See, in, 19, uh, in 2000 and three, I think, yes, 2003, uh, the US National Academy of Sciences celebrated 50 years of the Pauling helix. And uh, there was an article written by one of Pauling's most distinguished students, David Eisenberg, in which he said how great Pauling's work was. But in the article, when I read it, there was a sentence which said that Pauling and Corey, when they wrote, gave the models of the alpha helix, knew everything that uh, Ramachandran knew. 
Today's students are taught all these things with the Ramachandran diagram, but Pauling and Corey knew these principles so well that they felt there was no need of a diagram of the sort. This is a paragraph. So when I read this, I was at that time deeply offended. So I did more digging into the literature. And then I found the question, did Pauling recognize handedness of the amino acid when he gave his structures? The answer is no. Uh, all structures Pauling gave cleverly were for glycine, which is no achiral. So most of the structures that he gave in his original papers are left-handed structures, but they're perfectly fine. For a, but if you give the same structure for alanine, you will not be able to make it. But in later years, you find that the Ramachandran map allows you to decide what the handedness of a helix should be very easily. Uh, you will see that the Ramachandran map is extremely asymmetric uh, when you look at the allowed regions of space. So handedness is important, yes. Good afternoon, sir. Sir, first of all, it's an absolute pleasure listening to you. I'm here, right here. On your, on, your, on your left. On the left? Ah, oh, good. If you wave your hand, then yes. I see the movement. Sir, this yeah. is Dr. Ajay from the Anansagi University. Yeah. Uh, forgive me if my question is a little silly, but I want to know uh, why does the Ramachandran plot only show that alpha helices and beta pleated sheets are the most prominent conformations for most proteins? Or what is the reason that alpha helices and beta pleated sheets are the only most prominent conformations? Oh, why are they? Yes. Uh, the alpha helix certainly is driven by hydrogen bonding. The hydrogen bonding is optimal in the alpha helix, and it's cooperative. And this is how Pauling actually came upon it, because Pauling came to the alpha helix exclusively with only two pieces of uh, information. One is that uh, peptide units are planar and connected by a tetrahedral carbon atom. The second is that if you have NH and CO groups, they must be hydrogen bonded. So he actually used only paper models to get hydrogen bonded structures. The beta sheet forms because if you extend the chain, the hydrogen bonding groups point outwards. So they will immediately interact with another chain, giving a sheet-like structure. That's what happens in silk, for instance. So sheets and helices are the most common structures, both driven by hydrogen bonding. Anamika tells me one more. <laughs> and then she's going to ask me a question. Well, if no one else is there, you can ask the question. I have a question of my own, being a chemist myself. You did mention about the liraglutide peptide. So I don't want to get into the liraglutide sequence and anything, but I just want to ask you, how do you see peptide industry in India after 25 years when India will be celebrating its centenary independence. Thank you. You are asking me whether I see a bright future for the next 25 years. Huh? Uh, the way things are going, I don't. Uh, I think you need far more support for scientific research from government. You also need far more flexibility for carrying out research. The flexibilities are being taken away. In fact, we are slowly regressing uh, to the kind of regulatory systems that we had in the 1970s. And I think this is something that uh, whether industry will, if your question is, can we make a next generation uh, molecule in India? There is no reason why we cannot, but the, one would have to work uh, purposefully towards it. You have to have uh, a lot of stamina for these projects. And the stamina doesn't happen in India where you're looking for quick results. Novo Nordisk, which is a very, very large organization, took 12 years to do this. Now, uh, today, for example, Indian funding agencies, and this is, I think, largely due also to the gullibility of scientists. Even senior scientists believe that uh, complex problems can be solved in two years and three years. And this just doesn't happen.
Thank you so much, sir. Honestly, being a chemist myself, the part I liked most was how he defined chemistry as being language of life. Thank you for taking us through the journey of Ramachandran map and your very own research journey. We thank you for your magnific magnificent contribution towards exploring the AB amino acid, which was earlier known as MEA, which I honestly did not know. Thank you so much, sir, for your time and for your talk. I, ni I now invite Dr. Kritika for further proceedings. Thank you. Today's event is uh, presided over by a science enthusiast, very, our very own beloved justice, Dr. MNV. He began practicing law in 1951, was appointed as a permanent judge of the Karnataka High Court in 1975, and a judge at the Supreme, High, Supreme Court of India in 1987. He finally went on to become the 25th Chief Justice of India in 1993. He serves as the Chancellor of Sri Satyasai Institute of Higher Learning and a member of the advisory board of the Foundation for Restoration of National Values. From 1996 to 98, he was the chairman of National Human Rights Commission and in 2000, he chaired the National Commission to review the Constitution's working. He speaks science and knows science than most people. His faith in Prayoga is unfined. It is our as absolute pleasure and honor to have Justice Venkata Chalaya as the chairman of the advisory board of Prayoga. I request Justice MNV to deliver the presidential address. Sir, kindly shower your blessings on all of us and continue to inspire generations to come. I can talk. Uh, very good. Gentlemen, may I very respectfully request you to consider that this gentle but mighty scholar, we owe him a standing ovation. Kindly. One thing I was very happy about uh, after listening to this uh, scholar that I didn't study microbiology at all, thank God. I went to a more lucrative field of law. I was reminded of uh, an old statement that the sum total totality of all human knowledge is perhaps a small sphere floating in the vast expanse of the unknown. The bigger it, the ball becomes, the greater, greater is, it, is its contact with the unknown. Today's lecture tells us what kind of neurohormonal, neuroendocrinal, neuro, neuro, neuro um, uh, the nervous system and its control over the hormonal system, how it shapes our lives and how uh, what kind of a organization human human body is? Uh, and uh, I was wondering, what the future of human humankind would be with this kind of progress of human knowledge? Where we, I think the it is the scientists who will bring God before us and demonstrate to us what is the concept of God itself. The great telescopes are now catching up a light emanating 2,000 billion years ago, and then tell us what we can see the Big Bang ourselves happening. If that is so, they can also bring before us our ancestors. The light emanating from them can be intercepted and tell us how we can see our ancestors personally to the, the medium of this uh, telescope. God knows what is going to happen. But the, the subtotal of this, this, uh, this uh, uh, lecture and the demonstration of the, the physical dimensions of uh, the neurological dimensions of human existence, uh, I think that's going to be a new civilization itself. 
science is going to be the new civilization. It is the scientists who will perhaps demonstrate to us uh, the ultimate purpose of human creation itself. This, uh, the, uh, uh, Professor Balram, very gentle person, the immensity of his knowledge and his understanding of the processes of uh, uh, life is something, it is the life of all scholars. In fact, uh, the way in which everything is going to change with the progress of science, I'm reminded of uh, what happened in a French company a long time ago. They were manufacturing steam engines. One of the innovators came and said, somebody is doing some diesel engines, it may compete with us. The chairman very proudly said, we are going to sell steam engines for 100 years. In the next meeting, they brought a resolution for winding up the company itself. This is the kind of speed of change that is going to overtake everything. Somebody who went and told the blockbuster cinema man that uh, somebody is doing online shows, be careful. Netflix is, uh, is on your neck. They said, it will take a long time. The, and they went into uh, serious problems of obsolescence. This is the kind of world we live in. And these are the scholars who must be respected, kept, uh, kept uh, in pink of polish in their lives so that they may guide the, the uh, carefully guide society from, uh, from the pitfalls of science and also give them the benefit of science. Thank you very much, Professor, for your very profound, profound talk. And uh, the, that's why some paper said Indian Institute of Science, um, uh, I think some uh, n nature or some, uh, some, uh, some publication mentioned that in the last seven years, there are 1.1 million quality research papers in India. And he said, the paper also reported that it will gladden the heart of Professor Balram to know that large number of them are from the Indian Institute of Science. <laughs> and uh, the publication also says, one thing the scientists will perhaps do not know, that there is a super abundance of opportunities of funding today, more than any time before in, in Indian scientific past. There is super abundance of funding. In the, in, the, in the recent years. Thank you very much for your patience and courtesy. I convey on, on my behalf and on behalf of all of you our most grateful acknowledgement and thanks for the professor, for the, for the, uh, the storehouse of knowledge that he has and how he took us through the paces of the research in this wonderful field. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. I now request uh, Professor Balram and Dr. Hedgeson to kindly felicitate uh, Justice MNV. Thank you very much. Uh, we've come to almost towards the end of the uh, today's event. We have just a couple of things uh, to uh, finish. Mm, today's event is uh, sponsored by GD Waldner. Uh, it's a well-known lab furniture manufacturer with a tagline, we work with you to create the birthplace of your next scientific breakthroughs. Uh, they've partnered with us in providing the best in class furniture, fume hood, safety systems for the Prayoga campus. I now request Sri Ranjit Singh, the Vice President of G.D. Waldner, to kindly uh, deliver his talk. Since time immemorial, it is science that has been pushing the human race forward. Every scientific breakthrough has been a historic milestone, and everything we do, we do to push the boundaries of science. GD Lab Solutions 
was the first fume hood manufacturer in India to have equipped over 10,000 labs in the country. We have always been driven by our passion for furthering scientific advancement, for driving innovation and since time immemorial, it is science that has been pushing the human race forward. Every scientific breakthrough has been a historic milestone and everything we do, we do to push the boundaries of science. GD Lab Solutions was the first fume hood manufacturer in India to have equipped over 10,000 labs in the country. We have always been driven by our passion for furthering scientific advancement, for driving innovation and discovery. Since 1979, we have been a trusted name in providing a safe working environment for scientific breakthroughs. And now, we have merged with Waldner, Germany, a global leader in the industry. Waldner was founded in 1908 and has grown throughout its 100-year history to become a globally sought-after leader in laboratory infrastructure, furniture and fume hoods. The joint venture in India will provide a comprehensive and technically superior product and service, creating a more compelling value proposition for our customers. The joint venture allows us to offer a world-class product portfolio with the highest safety and energy efficiency and an unparalleled service setup at a faster pace than ever. We are now equipped to offer the MOC of your choice, metal products from facility at Varodhra or wood products imported directly from Germany. From concept to commissioning, we work with you every step of the way to ensure that we equip your laboratories with the highest quality products at a great value. Our end-to-end -end MEP and turnkey solutions include lab designing, HVAC, electrical, gas piping, plumbing and more as we will be the single source for your laboratory infrastructure needs. Our fume hoods are based on the same design, technology and quality processes as our plant in Germany, thereby giving you unmatched safety and energy efficiency. We also offer sophisticated process flow equipment and high-end educational systems from Waldner Education, Germany. Our production facility is spread over 10,000 square meters of floor space with state-of-the-art plant and machinery. We follow concepts of lean manufacturing, 5S and Kaizen in our production. The factory plan accommodates a laser for cutting, CNC bending machines, welding and assembly operations. The fully automatic powder coating plant includes a jet spray pre-treatment with a massive processing capacity. The strict standards and QC parameters that we adhere to ensure the highest degree of consistently repeatable quality for our customers. Our vision of setting up world-class R&D infrastructure facilities for the scientific fraternity to enable them in serving science and humanity. That's why we continue to be the solution provider of choice for leading brands in the pharmaceutical, chemical and related industries. We are now G.D. Waldner and we remain committed to creating the birthplace of your next scientific breakthroughs. Thank you everybody and uh, good afternoon uh, guest organizers and luminaries and uh, we thank you for giving us this opportunity to part to be part of this event it's an honor to be a part of this event and uh, after a fantastic you know uh, enriching uh, lecture by professor dr balram you know am i audible i think you know we are here uh, as one of the one of the lab solution uh, provider you know to take care of your entire needs uh, i'll just quickly run through the video covers most of most of our work you know in terms of who we are or what we do uh, i'll just quickly run through a few few of the slides to let you know our capabilities and how we can partner with you in uh, giving you the best next best lab spaces for your breakthrough uh, research so 
I'm from JD Walner. A little about Walner. Walner is the world's largest uh, laboratory infrastructure company, uh, who which has got 12 subsidiaries, presence in more than 100 countries, and uh, you know our revenue is more than 300 million uh, euros. Uh, we are uh, we are present in almost all the major uh, uh, major customers' laboratory facilities. Uh, we bring we sorry. We bring to you in in terms of uh, the entire turn to turnkey solution from end to end, right from next, uh, right from offering the entire turnkey and MEP services, laboratory fume hoods, uh, laboratory furniture, and process instrumentation. Next. So our value proposition is we uh, we start working with all our customers and clients from uh, day one in terms of need analysis, understanding their laboratory needs, uh, giving the uh, design concept, working on the infrastructure need, and doing a complete turnkey solution, whether it's uh, lab furniture, whether it's a fume hood, or whether it's an entire facility uh, setup. So we, we are... Uh, a Indo-German company, it's a joint collaboration of Indian company, GD Labs, which is more than 100 years old in this space, and a Walner, which is, again, more than 100 years, uh, a giant, you know, and, and a world's biggest in lab infrastructure company. We have collaborated uh, to give you the best of the best uh, technology and the best of the best processes in terms of material of construction and services to, uh, for this industry. Next. So these are our client base, you know, I mean, next. So I'll, I'll just quickly run you through some of the completed labs which we have done. Uh, we have done tens and thousands of labs here in India, you know, in this entire history of the existence of uh, GD Lab Solutions in Walner. We'll take you quickly through some of our existing newest uh, modern labs that we have done in past few recent years. These are some of the some of the projects we have concluded recently. Uh, if you look at the labs, you know again in our expertise are in terms of providing the best of the best uh, class in terms of offering a turnkey solution, right from uh, simple fume hoods furnitures to working fume hoods and the entire uh, facility setup. Next. Uh, these are some of the international projects. As I said, you know, we are an Indo-German company. We come with a very enriched experience of past 100 years of building and giving you the lab space of your choice. Uh, you know, so these are some of the some of the international projects we have done outside India. Next, so this is one of the project where we got the Lab of the Year award. Uh, this is in Seoul, South Korea, called CJ Blossom Park. Next. This is one from Sivonic, uh, Ivonic, Singapore. The beauty of this lab is everything you see is very modular. That means tomorrow if you want to restructure the lab, you can move the entire facility. You can move the service utilities, you can move the furniture, you can, everything is on caster. Based on your future requirement, based on your future uh, 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 research, uh, requirements, you know, you can just change the entire concept layout. So these are some of the uh, cutting edge labs or the new generation labs, green labs, which we are setting and our expertise is, again, to give you the some of the world class facility labs. And this is what we think is our contribution to science. So we, uh, summing up, you know, we are a, a, gl a global company uh, which is offering complete lab turnkey solutions uh, with a unique understanding of uh, lab solutions and lab needs for the last 100 plus years experience, offering a world-class portfolio with rapid uh, projection executions. Uh, again, once again, thank you so much for giving us this platform. Thank you, and we look forward with uh, partnering with some of you to build your next world-class facility. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, I now request Shri Valish Herur, uh, our managing trustee, to kindly propose the vote of thanks. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I consider it my 
a privilege and a great honor to propose a vote of thanks on this uh, memorable occasion. Uh, we at Prayoga are always grateful to uh, Justice Dr. M. N. Venkatachalaya, the chairman of our advisory board, a sage of the current times. Deep insights about diverse topics and the ability to perceive and articulate these normally imperceivable connections leave us totally in awe at all times. At the same time, the simplicity and enthusiasm to encourage and guide us is nothing but a sheer blessing. Uh, thank you, sir, for guiding us always and gracing this occasion as well. On behalf of Prayoga, I'd like to express my deep sense of gratitude to Professor Balara. Sir, thank you uh, for the wonderful lecture. And uh, it was, uh, we were in awe most of the time that for the tremendous insight and the wisdom that uh, was visible for us to see. Uh, thank you also for agreeing to be part of the Prayoga family and we wish to hope uh, wish and hope to receive your support and guidance in all our endeavors at Prayoga. Thank you very much, sir. I must express uh, a deep sense of gratitude to Professor P. R. Krishnaswamy. The unbelievable levels of positivity and unrestrained enthusiasm towards pursuing your knowledge at his age, as well as encouraging youngsters, are only to be experienced, to be believed. Uh, thank you. Uh, Professor PRK for being, for agreeing to be part of the Prayoga Advisory Board. We are highly inspired by your guidance and mentorship. Sir. I'm also thankful to the Advisory Board of, board of Prayoga, Professor Guru Rao, Dr. Omkar, Dr. Nagasuma, Sri Balakrishna Adiga and uh, Sri MP Kumar for always being there and enri enriching us by showing new paths and possibilities. Uh, extend my thanks to the research mentors, uh, many of, be, of them who are online today, I see uh, Dr. Rangarajan here in the, uh, among the, uh, in the audience today. Thank you very much, sir, for taking time and coming on board. Uh, we are eager to collaborate on the ongoing research and academic projects at Prayoga. We are fortunate to have eminent and renowned scientists and researchers from Indian Institute of Science, NCBS, JNCASR, and from industry with us today, and also from uh, very reputed universities. Uh, Professor KNB, Professor VK, my, uh, and many others here. We look forward to having many more interactions in the near future with, uh, with regards to research, learning, and teaching. Thank you all for being part of this program. It has been a pleasure to host all of you. I extend my sincere thanks to RV institutions, we are actually privileged to be partnering with RV institutions in, in many ways and more so in uh, specifically organizing today's event. Uh, I would like to acknowledge the support of and the presence of uh, Sri Avias Murthy, Secretary, RV Institutions here. Uh, we also receive continuous support from Sri M. P. Shyam and D.P. Nagraj, the President and the Joint Secretary of the institutions. Uh, thanks once again, and uh, we look forward to uh, working with you and uh, seek your continued support as well, sir. Uh, special mention goes out to the sponsors of today's event, uh, J.D. Warner, Trespa, and Rowan Lab, without whose contributions we could not have organized this event. Thank you, Rajiv and uh, Mohan Apple for extending your support. Uh, dear members of the academic frater fraternity and researchers, students, Thank you for your presence and enthusiastic participation. Uh, you truly made this event very successful and memorable. We have been fortunate enough to be backed by a team of very motivated and dedicated colleagues at Prayaga who have worked very hard in making this event happen. My sincere thanks to every one of them. They have been ably supported by a set of volunteers uh, who have done a tremendous job over the last few days in making this event successful. Uh, I need to mention the support of uh, digital and TV media teams, Vistara TV, Sri Murli and team from Red Turkey, Ms. Pooja, Sri Nandish and team from the uh, PN Junction for the timely help and support. And thanks to Sri Nagraj Bhatt for 
the catering services. It's an exhaustive list and if I have missed out on thanking anyone uh, for such an appreciable involvement and willingness in making this event successful, please accept my uh, sincere gratitude. One last thing, Prayoga is a young and passionate organization in the private space working towards improving the quality of education in our country. We sincerely hope that with your association, participation and support, Prayoga's work towards building a solid foundation for education in our country and improving the standards will be significantly boosted. Thank you all once again. Uh, I request everyone to stand for the national anthem. Janagana mana adhinayaka jaya hai Bharat bhagya vidhata Punjab, Sindh, Gujarat, Maratha, Dravida, Utkala, Vanga, Vindya, Himachala, Yamuna, Ganga, Utchala, Jaladhi, Taranga, Tava, Shubha, Name, Jage, Tava, Shubha, Ashish, Mage, Dahe Tava Jaya Gatha Jana Gana Mangala Dayak Jaya He Bharat Bhagya Vidhata Jaya He Jaya He Jaya He Jaya 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 He Thank you very much everyone. Kindly join us for lunch. Lunch is being served on the left of, the, of mine. And another quick announcement. Anybody who is interested to be getting associated with Prayoga, kindly let us know and leave your contacts at the check-in counter. Thank you very much. <laughs>